an, an emerging. And uh, meanwhile, I would also like all of those who are present in this session and they're joining from you know different countries or different places to take some time to acknowledge uh, the people, the uh, the traditional owners of the land they come from. So moving on, uh, so today we have got Dave Jani with us. Uh, talking a bit about giving a brief about uh, Dave Jani. She's a registered architect in both New South Wales and uh, coming from Indian background, she's also a registered architect in India. And uh, she is currently working uh, with SDR and uh, she has done a lot of projects in different countries uh, from Netherlands, Sydney, India, and uh, there's a huge list. And uh, she specializes in health and community projects. And uh, without a further ado, I would like to invite and open the floor to Dave Jani to take this on this beautiful journey of uh, why and how do we call ourselves an architect. Thanks, David and Asna. I hope you can all see the screen. Yes, we can. Yes. So good evening and welcome all. And if you didn't already know, this is also NIDOC week. This country always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And the very first footprints on this continent were those belonging to First Nations people. And I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, we all have seen some form of this caricature, what being an architect means to your family, to your friends, to your client, to yourself. Another, oops, another aspect of that caricature is what does being an architect mean to the registration board? So this cartoon is obviously from the UK, so that's why it has the RIBA in NSW, obviously, what does it mean? Um, for the architects registration board. So in simple terms, if you haven't registered with the board, you are not allowed to refer to yourself um, as an architect. You can uh, call yourself um, a graduate of architecture or architectural coordinator, et cetera, et cetera, but not an architect. And why is that? Why isn't five years of university enough to call yourself an architect? Why is the title architect protected? And um, lots of uh, graduates, fresh and experienced, have said this is discriminatory and feels like an exclusive agenda. And then the usual names dropping of all the great architects who weren't registered. So let's keep these issues in mind. And I'm going to circle back to these questions later. But to understand why one needs to be registered, we need to approach this from a different perspective. So the architectural world, or at least the Australian architectural cosmos is divided into two sections, governance, which dictates the rules and regulations and the industry within which you know, your practices or your firms sit. So what does that mean? AACA, which a lot of us would be aware of, and the registration board sits under governance, and the Australian Institute of Architects and the ACA, they sit under the industry forum. And then the NSW Architects Registration Board, that actually sits under the NSW Department of Customer Service. Now, without going into too much detail, all this stems from a little piece of legislation and here it's an NSW legislation called the Architects Act, which has been created by the parliament. And this will be same in other states and territories like in Victoria or Canberra, wherever. So, so basically every state or territory, it has a piece of legislation called the Architects Act, which would have been passed by the parliament of that state. Now this Architects Act mandates the architects regulation. And all that means is that it is a detailed set of requirements on how the act is interpreted and enacted. And who looks after that is the architects registration board. So that's why we have this various registration boards. So hence this board sits under the department of customer service to make sure that you know everything is fine. And notice the word customer in it. So 
all this hullabaloo of registration is actually not for you. It's not for me. It's not for architects. It's not for graduate. It is purely for consumer protection. Sorry, dear Johnny, your voice broke off. We can't hear you. Um, Deb, can you hear us? Because yeah, we can't hear you. Yeah, I think it's just um, frozen on the lecture screen. Yep, I guess her voice is a bit of a network issue. Yeah, we'll just give her some time to join back. Meanwhile, if anyone has got any questions, uh, just feel free to type in your questions uh, in the chat. Yeah, I think she'll be joining back. Yep. Yeah, she's saying she got disconnected. Hmm, interesting. It's difficult to hack technology. Yeah. I mean, I guess the one good thing about actually doing it in person is that this can't happen. <laughs> Unless <laughs> some guy was to like budge into the lecture and hold us up or something. Yeah. Yeah, she's trying. Probably she'll, she'll be there any moment. We've got plenty of time um, to fit it in anyway. So. Yeah. Oh, while we are waiting, can everyone drop in the chat? Like, what year are you guys in architecture? Let's let's use the chat function. Hi, Terence. What what year of architecture? Ah, third. This session is definitely for you then. Hmm. Second, first. Well, I'll just I'll be back. I'll just give Deb uh, a call and check if she's able to. Okay. Oh. oh, she's coming back in. Sorry, guys. I just lost electricity in my apartment. So now I'm hot spotting from my mobile. I don't oh. know what happened there. I don't know how much of it you guys got, but uh, okay. Let's, okay. Let's go back to sharing. Yep. So, so you were talking about the NSW, like the customer bit that these two institutes have a customer. Yeah. So that was the last thing. Yeah. I think I was talking, uh, that's where I got disconnected. Yeah. So yep. we have the governance NSW architects registration board, which sits under the department of customer service, which basically it's um, all coming. I don't know. Did you guys hear about the act that it's all from the act? Nope. Okay, no, okay. So anyway, so the NSW Architects Registration Board, which is the governing body, it sits under Department of Customer Service. And why is that? It's because uh, without going into too much detail, all this stems from a piece of NSW legislation called the Architects Act 
which has been created by the parliament. And it will be similar in other states and territories. They would have their, you know, similar legislation, which kind of has the similar, you know, the Victorian Architects Act or uh, the ACT Architects Act. So basically this act mandates the architect's regulation. And all that means is that it is a detailed set of requirements on how the act is interpreted and enacted. And this is where the various registration boards come in because they govern that. So they see how that act is being enacted. So notice the word customer over here. So basically all this hullabaloo of registration is actually not for you. It is purely for consumer protection. So the, basically the act was created to protect the citizens and how that is done is that somebody under the government is keeping a watchful eye so that you know their citizens are not cheated or their citizens get the rightly skilled person to do their work. So what does that mean for us? Now that we have figured out registration is basically for consumer protection and that all sits on this side, which is all governance, but we are in the industry. So what does that mean for us? So we do have some people, um, some organizations on, your, on our side, and that's the Australian Institute of Architects who often um, refer to themselves as friends of architects. So if you have any issues, you know, you go and you talk to them and they try to help you out. And we also have the Association of Consulting Architects. No, we need to register for consumer protection. So there are various pathways to be registered. And the easiest one and the least painful one is uh, accredited qualification from an Australian university. And then you undertake and record your minimum period of practical experience under the registered architect. And all this kind of is overseen by the AACA. When should one register? I guess as soon as you have that minimum experience. Um, but again, that is a personal opinion because sometimes you could feel that you're not ready and you would like to wait you know, a few more years or a couple of years more. So what does that mean for you? Like for people, you know, like Asna who's going to graduate in three weeks or for people like Kai who are in their second year. All that means you do a bit of back calculation. So when you interview or when you're ready to join a firm, you make your intentions clear to the firm saying that, you know, eventually one day you want to get registered. And they'll actually help you because you need, you know, certain you need certain hours of experience under certain competencies. So if you make these intentions clear to your firm, they'll make sure that they provide you the opportunity, the platform to gain that experience. And any kind of firm, whether it's a small firm or you know a tier one firm, international firm, they'll always help you in achieving this career goal. So the best way to plan for this is to make your intentions clear. Now, how do you register? I think everyone knows about this. So you have your logbook and statement of practical experience, which is, where, which is why you need to have that minimum requirement which the AACA sets out, because this is all controlled by the AACA. And then part two is you sit the national examination paper, again, controlled by the AACA. Then if you pass that, you sit for part three, which is the examination by interview, which is done by the board. So what does that mean? So what are these guys doing here? Because remember I said there are friends. So what you can do is you can do the practice of architectural learning series, which is basically, you know, that they, they have lectures and tutorials on all those modules on which you will be quizzed on, on which you will be tested on. So once you submit your logbook and statement of practical experience to the ASCA, and then the ASCA gets back to you and said, right, this is all good. You're all set to sit for the national exam paper. That's when you say, right, I'm going to go to my friends and I'm going to have some group study sessions and prepare for it. And this also prepares you for part three, which is done by the architects registration board. Or you can do PARC, which is not by the Australian Institute of Architects. I think it's by a private organization, which is equally good. 
how to stay register simple keep up your professional development because again consumer protection the arb can audit you because they want to know that the services that you're providing to the citizens the government wants to make sure that you're providing the best professional service for which you need to be updated with what's happening you know in terms of material or sustainability or whatever whatever so your knowledge needs to be updated to the current market because you can get audited so how do you keep up your professional development you go to industry organize various formal and informal courses or you can also brush up on the practice of architecture learning series or park so you know this it's basically all just to keep yourself updated with the knowledge and the skill so now i want to circle back to that registration question where like you know people said this is exclusive why is isn't my 5 years enough to call for myself an architect because the business of architecture is actually quite complex and in university we have the free hand the free reign to have our creative expression but we don't know about you know what are the processes or we don't understand rather what are the processes leading up to you know how to run a firm what is the law what is the practice management what is the fees that you should charge how to do contract admin and these are all skills necessary when you want to run your own firm and based on all these things that's why you need that experience to understand all those things and that's why you go or you read up on your own on the modules to understand what that means and then you go and register because that's how you'll be able to provide the best business the best outcome to your client and your client deserves only the best so why do i have to go through registration to call myself an architect again remember it is for consumer protection it is not for your ego or for your satisfaction it is something that the government has created to ensure that its citizens are protected same why it's not an exclusive agenda it's for consumer protection le corbusier was never a fully licensed architect and i've heard that quite often and tada wando never went to university and sorry to be pessimistic but you are neither so you might just as well do this one last step because you know for me i think like you have gone through that 5 years of university and at the end of it you do want to call yourself an architect and if this is the last step so be it so let's do it and let's allow ourselves to have that you know that honor to call ourselves an architect so and i can obviously talk to this from my perspective why is this important for me and it's very subjective because i've also met a lot of people lot lot of experienced you know graduates i call them experienced graduates because you're not allowed to call them architects lot of directors who are not registered because it depends on what you're doing a lot of people just want to be in the design part in the front end where you go you design you present to clients and for that necessarily you don't need to do the registration because you're not doing contract admin or you're not you know tendering for a job or you're going to not read the contract because someone else is doing it so it's absolutely fine if you want to go down that pathway and you should totally do that but you should also think about registration if you want to have your own firm or if you want to be you know you want to see a project built till the end where you need to do contract admin or you want to tender for a job because you totally feel like you can do that job so what does that mean to me it empowers me to advise the client and make decisions in the room as a project lead because i run projects so often the contractor can get very pushy and make me do things which is not within my scope and i can because i have that knowledge i can always come back equally strong i can stand my ground and i can say no mr contractor no mr builder i'm not going to do that you have to do this because that's what you are supposed to do another thing i did not study in australia so it was even if i didn't register like even if i failed it i would still understand because for me it's important to understand the regulatory context of the country that i'm working in because you know rules are different in different countries so i didn't study here so i have no basis to know anything i just arrived here one day so i think registering helped me understand what is the context of all this 
work that is going around here because NSW is also a very litigious state. It is second most litigious to America. And sometimes Americans say that NSW might be higher in that. So it's very important to be careful in the decisions that I make. So I need to understand that. So that registration to be registered as an architect allowed me to be that architect. And something I want that which I just mentioned like 10 minutes ago that you, I want to be called an architect after my five-year degree, albeit from a different country, but I do have experience from other countries and I don't want to be called a graduate of architecture or architectural coordinator. So it's a bit of that as well. And uh, I'm not Tada Wando or Lee Corbusier. And I also know that often women architects get overlooked. So registration did provide me that visibility in the room. And I know for every registration for everyone is a personal journey. So I think you just got to figure out what is the decision? Why do you want to do it? And once you have, or not do it. So once you have decided on that, so if you have understood why you want to do it, then I would say like totally go for it because it does give you some advantages and it gives you the visibility, it empowers you. And oftentimes like companies will rely on you because you are a registered architect, you might get more responsibilities compared to a person with the same amount of experience, but not registered because registration also gives you that shield or the company thinks you have that shield, you can make the right decisions. So yeah, so I think that's why I think that's the background on why you should get registered. Thanks, Tib. Thanks, Abjani, for uh, like taking this subject, you know, really quickly. A very boring subject indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But you took it so well. And uh, I didn't realize that we have almost reached seven o'clock. So, yeah. That's exactly. because I got disconnected in the middle. It was, yeah, it was just like 10 minutes, I guess. Yeah. It's because I'm just talking about, you know, why you should be registered. I'm not going into what all you need to do if you want to be registered. So, yeah. it's just to understand, like, the first thing about any subject is, like, understand what is it and why you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think most people feel like, oh, what is registration for? Like, it's basically for consumer protection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you have... Some, you might be a sole trader one day or you might have your own firm. Yeah. So you need to know that whatever you're doing is legal. Whatever the advice you're giving is the best advice to your client. And that's why you, even when you're in a big firm, like you kind of work, you know, on clients one-to-one. -one. So you basically need to have that knowledge. So I think it's very important if you want to kind of go to site build projects, advise clients, because yeah then you also don't get pushed into doing things which is outside your scope, which doesn't work in your, um, in your firm's favor, because then you have allowed for work for a certain fees. And if the client or the contractor pushes you to do more, you can always push back saying, no, like I'm not going to do it or pay me more for it. And all this knowledge comes from, you know, different parts, different experiences, different modules, different things that you study in registration. So, yeah, so, and that's why they say that you should register after you have certain minimum experience. Mm -hmm. because they want you to do that. To be, basically, it's to able to make, you know, good decisions. Right. Uh, so, uh, I see, like, we, while you were gone, I did ask people, like, what mm -hmm. years of uh, their study are they from? So, most of them are from, you know, second, first, third mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, uh, since they are attending this session, what do you think is the right time to, you know, start making those decisions of when, what to do, like in terms of as you're proceeding with your career? Yeah. So, like you were saying, like, uh, since this is one last step to call yourself an architect, so obviously, like being a master's student, I think uh, right from your second or third year, you should start planning if you want to do your master's. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, any sort of that advice? That yeah, I, yeah, I would say like when you have finished your bachelor's and you're starting with your master's, I think it's good to strategize and plan because then I'm not sure you'll have to check the ASEA website, but I think you can log a few hours that you do before you graduate. I'm not sure about that because I didn't go through that pathway. Yeah, I guess you can. Um, yeah, but I think like uh, once you finish your bachelor's and I think that's the right time to start 
because that's also the right time you decide on your masters you decide which firm maybe you want to work as a student architect you mm -hmm. set yourself up and often the places you work as a student architect you often continue there as um, graduates so mm -hmm. you know you have that continuity of experience because as students maybe you are doing only models or whatever and then once you graduate you start doing some drawings mm -hmm. so i think from that when you start masters you strategize you go to that office and you say right i want to get registered so you know mm -hmm. so once you graduate the kind of the office helps you like you know you do a few months of this you do a few years of this so it makes sure that you have the experience in all those competencies that you need to have mm -hmm. and again in the competencies they don't expect that's why it's after two years of uh, i think it's minimum is two years after graduation i think um, you'll have to check the website but um, in that competencies they have like some of the competencies uh, you just have to log your hours as an observer mm -hmm. because obviously they know in two years is not enough for you to get like a participant or an executive experience so you have like three levels of experience that you need executive participant and observer oh. so so that's why it's good to go through that like you know and strategize and also to make yourself aware right in this competency i need to be a participant in this competency i need to be an observer so in that sense you can kind of graph where you work for how many months in which way you know okay so i um, think yeah, masters would be a good time to start strategizing uh also like uh, you are telling about the different competencies so obviously like students uh uh before we like finish our masters so i remember from my professional placement class that mm -hmm. uh even before i finish my master so we need approx 2 years of logged experience to you know sit for you know send our expression of interest or sit for the mm -hmm. exam so one year can be uh, pre masters so say for students who are you know starting third year uh, in their third year they can start logging all those experience and uh, after their masters or while they are doing their masters and once they finish their masters they can you know finish up if they are so you know focused towards uh getting re themselves registered they can do that so in terms of competencies uh can you sort of uh suggest like where do we exactly know what sort of competencies do we need or yeah is there a document and something there like is that? a document so aac actually has that document so if you down because anyway you have to do the logbook so logbook you have to download from aac Oh, they have a okay. format yeah they have a format it's basically a controlled excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. in which you are supposed to put in uh, the months and the hours that you did mm -hmm. and you put the hours under those competencies i can't remember now but yeah it's a controlled document that you got to download and once you download that document that will exactly tell you in what you need exactly your experience in Uh -huh. and some things you might be able to get pretty soon like let's say uh, like drawings and stuff like that i can't remember what's the competency but like design brief and like you know how you implement the design brief now this is something that you might be able to work quicker have experience quicker than let's say on how to do i think it's about contract admin or something procurement or something procurement hardly anyone ever sits for procurement mm -hmm. because only you know the main architect would be sitting for procurement meetings that too in our office architects don't go for procurement meetings because the government does the procurement of contractors procurement basically means how you pick the contractor so oh, okay. so you may never have experience in that but even if you're in a small firm your boss might be going sitting with the client to get a procurement of a contractor so once you download that um, that sheet that uh, logbook uh, pro performa or whatever that exactly tells you in what you need what you need to be aware of and in some things you will get experience easily you don't have to ask for it and in some you'll realize oh i don't think i have experience in this or i got to focus on this for the next 6 months yeah nice yeah even i wasn't knowing that there is a logbook so i i think i should start logging my experience totally and another thing like start logging that's what everyone says like start logging on the go because it's very difficult to retrospectively think about it because as architects we are often uh, overworked mm -hmm. so we are not going to remember anything like you know then you'll have to start making shit up which you don't want to do <laughs> like yeah 
Yeah, because I remember. You, you get interviewed. So the part three, where they interview you, they are actually looking at your logbook and statement. So you don't want to, you know, make stuff up. And that's why they say, like, start filling it on the go. So that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, also, I remember, like, uh, like architectural study, like whatever we learn from architecture is only a percentage of, uh, uh, like, this criteria, right? Uh, Mm. you are not going to use any design knowledge in registration registration is everything to do with architecture which is not related to design oh okay basically from our perspective because it's for consumer protection okay. registration is basically how not to get sued okay <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the way to put it like very bluntly and so registration is basically it's the regulatory context mm -hmm. that's what it is so it has got nothing to do with your creativity, nothing to do with your design. Mm -hmm. Because for your clients, so think about this. Again, think about it from a consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. for, for your client, let's say, and I think registration was mainly done for um, families who want to build their house and they go to an architect. So for this family of four, for the mom and dad, they're going to an architect to build a home and they're going with all their savings. That's all their money. Now, the, now, how do you ensure that they don't get cheated or their money is, you know, used in the best way? Well, architects actually never cheat. That's, an, that's a wrong statement mm -hmm. because architects never run for money. They run there for fame. But anyway, mm -hmm. so this family, which is trusting you with all their savings, right. how do they know you're the right person? They know you are the right person because government has given you a stamp or a regulatory body has given you a stamp of approval saying this architect knows what he the rules and laws and is best suited to provide you advice. So it's from that perspective to give the consumer that confidence that the person they're going to is going to give them the best solution. So registration often comes from that and from you know, from the architect's perspective, they should know like the contract that they prepare or the contract that they sign, it works, you know, for the client and, you know, the fees that they put is a proper fees. It's not too low. It's not too high. When there's a contractor involved who is building the house of this family of four who have put all their money, the architect is able to kind of, you know, oversee that. So the architect has that knowledge. So, yeah, it's again all for consumer protection because they don't know. They're only going to build that house once in their life with their savings. So they need to be protected in some sense. In, in short, you mean that registration is all about, you know, reality. So yeah. while we are at architecture to school, we are, you know, yeah. doing designing. We are learning the yeah. skills that are needed. But yeah. uh, one registration process sort of builds all that you know real life problems yeah. and things yeah. that we might be you know yeah. we should be knowing or oh. if the contractor like you know tries to tell the client that you know i can't do this and then the architect steps in like nobody that's what you got to do because i know the rules and yeah it's basically to for the business for the business and not not to get sued and yeah and to understand the risk what are the risk of a business and everything so mm -hmm. so yeah so it's nothing to do with creativity nothing to do with the design that you do that i think that we develop in university mm -hmm. that's what university is for right yeah um, um regarding sorry are we getting that that topic i have another question on top of that so um i i thought after when you when architects design a building registered or not when it's after it's being built, there's like government people who come and check the building to see whether they pass the law. No, uh, there is a certifier who comes and sees yeah. who certifies it. So to see that, you know, that uh, you have not clad it in combustible cladding or all your doors comply with the AS 1428s, but it's to do with the occupancy of the building. But tomorrow, if the client is suing you for something, let's the client say this building, what you have designed, it's not fit for purpose. The, the uh, certifier is not going to be able to help you. Nice. So, yeah, so it's a completely different uh, situation. So how do you fight back in this situation? How do you dispute what the client is saying or how you're prepared yourself 
or let's say um, there's something to do with hiring of consultants for the project. So the certifier is not going to tell you what to do with the consultants. You need to know how to hire the consultants. So registration is important for all of that. Okay, understood. Uh, are there any more questions anyone wants to ask? I know like uh, most of us here have a bare, you know, knowledge about all this registration process. So I guess one thing for all of us would be definitely, you know, start looking into what we want out of our careers, yeah. which way we want to head. That's that's what I can think of right now. But since you are here, Dev, uh, can you also, you know, you are into uh, healthcare and uh, you are working in such a niche field, uh, I, I was just thinking like, if you can sort of share your experience with uh, being in healthcare or uh, if you can sort of yeah, give some background info of what to expect in healthcare so that, you know, all the participants here, if they at all want to get into healthcare, they know what they're expecting. Yeah. Well, uh, the good thing about health is I think, which I often keep telling you as nice, like you'll never be out of a job because you always need hospitals and community health centers. And I think it kind of goes similar for education projects. Like you always need schools as population increases, as you have more kids, you'll always have schools. So I think healthcare for me, I, I mean, it's the most exhilarating and at the same time, mo most annoying, you know, like <laughs> the amount of work that we have to do, especially during this pandemic, because all hospitals were kind of preparing, you know, for a worst case scenario. But yeah, like health also, the good thing about health or NSW health, because again, in Australia, everything is very state based. So uh, for NSW, it's NSW health. In health also like depends on how you want to do it. So in health also, there are two streams. There is obviously the architecture part of it, but there's also the clinical planning part of it. So who are often again architects, but they have just done years and years and they become specialized in clinical planning. So what that means is like they plan the insides of the building. So imagine like, you know, master planning, but inside the building. Like where is going, where is it going to be your entrance, which is called front of house? Where is it going to be your, you know, public lift? Where is going to be your staff lift? Where are going to be the departments? Where is going to be ED? Where is going to be operating theaters? Where are you going to have just the, the wards, the beds? Or where are you going to have your sterilizing unit because all the equipment that you use need to be sterilized. So they do all that planning, that quite intensive planning inside, which again becomes very specialized because again, Australia is very regulatory. So there is a guideline that they need to follow. And, uh, and the other part is architecture, which is basically you decide how your facade is going to be, how your slab is going to be, how are you going to waterproof it? and basically everything else that's not to do with clinical planning. So yeah, so it depends uh, like what you want to do, but yeah, one thing is for sure, you'll never run out of a job. So that's the good thing about health. You're on mute, Asna. Sorry, my bad. So we have got a question from Carson. Uh, he's writing for the logbook requirement. Can we start putting the hours in the logbook once we find an internship, regardless of whether we have finished our bachelor's study? Example, I can't, if I, I can't answer that. I'm not ASCA. You'll have to check with ASCA. Yeah. So again, that's why I said this presentation is about giving you a bit of background on if you want to register and why you need to register. Another thing to remember is whatever I'll tell you will be my knowledge from three years back. And one thing to note is that ASCA, NSW, ARB, and even the Australian Institute of Architects, they keep updating their rules every year, mm -hmm. literally every year, like mm -hmm. the way the exam is run, the way the exam, you know, format is, it gets updated every year. So mm -hmm. it's best to go to the website and best to, you know, contact people. And I know that ASCA is quite responsive. Like, so is the Institute, the ARB, not so much, but I guess they are busy auditing architects, but they mm -hmm. always respond to you. So you'll just have to check that, like, when can you start logging in your hours? But that's what I mean, like, you know, strategizing. So like, start thinking about it once you join your masters and start contacting the proper channels. Yeah. 
uh, uh, for that, like uh, there are acumen notes as well. So uh, Carson, if uh, if you want to, you know, check any of this, you can always refer to acumen notes, which you can find no. on. Again, that's the institute. Acumen oh. notes belongs to the institute. So remember that first slide I showed. Mm -hmm. So governing bodies AAC and NSW ARB. So the logbook statement, the exam and the interview is all this side and acumen notes is your friends of mm. architects who are helping you prepare for that so mm. acumen notes is not going to tell you anything about logbook nothing oh, okay nothing. acumen notes okay. is just to prepare you it's giving you the subjects the modules to read to prepare for the exam but if you really want to know like like what is the exam format? What do you need to fill in your logbook? You need to go to the ASA website. I think that's mm -hmm. often the mistake that people do. They send a lot of questions to the Australian Institute of Architects and they can't help you. <laughs> thank you so much for clearing that doubt. I was thinking all this. <laughs> yeah. All, yeah, thank you. Uh, Kai has also uh, written a question. Generally do registered architects get paid more than non-registered ones? If so, by how much? Would have no idea. <laughs> Because one thing nobody like talks about that salary in the open. <laughs> and I can't ask somebody who is not registered, who is my experience. I can't go and ask, hey, what's your pay like? <laughs> so, but I think it's like an unspoken thing that um, yeah, registered architects do get paid more or they can kind of negotiate for more if that's the better word. But yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you <laughs> like how much they get paid more. But yeah, there is a certain respect that does come from being registered. I mean, I do have to, I, like I was talking about that visibility that you get, you know, that kind of boost that you get in your career because you're registered. Well, fortune, fortunately, unfortunately, you do get that boost because some people would like to argue, you know, like, why do I have to be registered? I just want to design and, you know, just let my creativity flow. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, you do get a boost, which means it sometimes can translate into better pay. <laughs> So, hmm. wow! Thanks, thanks for that question, Kai. Uh, I know we we are getting close to you know finishing this session. Just one more question, uh, Deb, probably from my side. Mm. I guess I've got so many questions, <laughs> uh, but I guess it might help everyone. So uh, I was just wondering, like you were doing PALS workshop, right? Like you mm -hmm. were, uh, and it's it helps, you know, people prepare for examinations and all that. So what was that topic that you were, you know, uh, giving talks or preparing? You know, so for? I wasn't doing the lectures. So they like the lectures are well, now it's become all online because of COVID. So um, like the lecture, I think is pre recorded. So normally, when I did pass, how it was face to face lectures. So you go to um, Tusculum in Potts Point, where you go and sit your lectures. Uh, so there are 12 modules. So you do it for 12 weeks. So we used to have the lectures Monday evening after office. So you have one hour of lecture, then we used to have half an hour of break. And then we used to have tutorials. So where they break you in like any university kind of teaching. So what I was doing was basically tutorials, but online. So I did the last tutorial, which was on contract admin. So they had already done their online lecture and the tutorial, it was me and two other people. And there were just questions coming, you know, and like after they have studied the module and as it was the last module they were preparing for the exam. So they had other questions also. So they were just asking questions and between the three of us, we were trying to answer them in the best way possible. And one of the panelists was Melanie Bale-Smith. I think she also teaches at UNSW. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She has been involved in this for quite some time, like in the... Um, registration thing and you know i guess uh, tutoring at pals and all of that yeah so okay so actually pals pals or park any of them is quite good i mean you can sit and study on your own but then you don't get that tutorial that interaction that group discussion and you meet other people and you can often decide to do your own study mm -hmm. group so i think it's a good thing to go and yeah make use of that, that facility since they are our friends we got to keep the friends on our side Yes, definitely. Thank you for all this vast amount of information in such short time, Devjani. Uh, so I guess we are about to, you know, finish this session. But yeah, we would like to thank you. Oh, we have got one more question. Okay, go ahead, Kai. 
Yeah, is there any cases, example, where a country would recognize an, an, a registered architect from a different country? Depends on the bilateral relations, like anything else. So I think currently, again, this could have been updated. My knowledge is like four years old when I came from India to check that. But um, obviously, Australia and New Zealand, they recognize each other's registration for a long time. And then they signed an agreement. So I think between Canada and Australia, Japan and Australia, Singapore and Australia, and some states in America. So they recognize each other's registration. And again, this could have been updated. But yeah, these are the countries that recognize each other's So it sounds like um, it's better to get registered in certain countries, right? So they, they get, you get recognized in other countries as well. Only if you want to go somewhere else, but I do know <laughs> American registration is way more tougher. So their registration is a bit di different. They mm. actually, you have to sit like 10 exams on me uh, mechanical, electrical, uh, hydraulic, on architecture, on structural. So they have actual exam papers on actual subjects and then there is law. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how Japan, Singapore or Canada does it, but uh, well, uh, I'm guessing they also have uh, something similar to the Australian way or to the American, but, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure America is the toughest. But yeah, so these are the few countries that recognize each other's registration, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kai, for asking such great questions. It sounds uh, like Australia might be the easiest to get registered <laughs> since you're already studying in Australia. Uh, yeah, I might, I might actually go back to China to continue my architecture studies, so. Yeah, I think I don't think there is a like a reciprocal um, recognition of uh, the Chinese registration and Australian registration. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you, Devjani, for uh, giving us time in your busy schedule and just letting us know about this complicated process of you know registration and why to register. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you on behalf of ArcSoc and Sona. Uh, and before we, you know, sort of uh, get off or dial off, uh, just wanted everyone to let, uh, to know about, uh, so there are two events coming by OXOC. So there's Q&A session for by third years on Friday, the 20th November, which is week 10. I know everyone would be busy, but uh, I mean, everyone can jump on for just a few minutes of Q&A and I, I, I'm sure it would be informative. Similarly, there's a Q&A for master's student, I, I think I'm the only master's student here, but <laughs> whosoever would be seeing this recording later. Uh, it is on 4th December, uh, and I guess it's after most of our submissions, so it should work well for everyone. And also, uh, Sona, so since I'm a Sona rep, uh, Sona is going to organize a, a competition, a student-based competition come internship during the, the summer, which I'm also organizing, like, along with uh, a few industry and uh, educational partners. And it's called Back to the Future and I'll be dropping the link for its Instagram and Facebook page uh, now in the chat. So just in case if everyone wants to follow that. So it's called Back to the Future. So it's both on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Yeah, I'm just dropping the Facebook link now. And yeah. Thank you all for joining us today and uh, hope you all have a nice rest of your day. And uh, yeah, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank it you. was a pleasure. Thanks for Bye. joining us now. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>